Hi, welcome back to ESV46 Basic Thermodynamics. This is Module 7.1 on Entropy. The sections in the textbook are 7.1 to 7.2. So let's look at our course outline, and we're moving down into Chapter 7 now, and what we're going to be discussing is entropy. And this is going to more or less wrap up the second law of thermodynamics. The very last little bit when we talk about exergy, we'll see it's actually a combination of both the first and second laws. Here are the three learning outcomes for this module. At the end of the module, you'll understand the definition of entropy. You'll be able to relate entropy to internally reversible heat transfer, and you'll understand why total entropy must increase. So first, I want to go through the definition of entropy, and I'm going to follow very closely with the definition of the textbook, which is the classic definition for it. So first, let me go ahead and, and describe the system that I've, I've got here. What I have is a reversible heat engine here in the middle, and it is attached to a system. And this might be, for example, a piston cylinder system. And I'm not going to make any other stipulations about the system being reversible or irreversible or steady state or anything like that at this point. Let's go ahead and define some quantities. So this heat engine is going to be absorbing energy from a high temperature reservoir, and that amount I'll call QH. It's going to be generating some work. I'm going to call it W reversible because this is a, a reversible heat engine. Um, and now I've got my system that is also generating some work. I'll call it just W cis. Um, there is heat that's going into my system that's coming from the uh, being rejected from the heat engine. So I'm going to go ahead and call that quantity Q. And my system is going to be at a temperature T. Right? Um, so what I'm going to do now is do an energy balance over the combined system. So both the reversible heat engine and my regular system here. So what I have is the change in energy inside my box is going to be equal to the energy that goes in minus the energy that goes out. So standard first law. And if I look at the arrows going in, what's going in is QH. And what is coming out are my two work terms, W reversible plus W of the system. And that's going to be the change in energy inside the box. I'll just go ahead and call that WE for now. Right? Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to equate, I'd like to uh, draw an analogy between QH and the actual temperature and the amount of Q going into my system. So remember, if this is a reversible heat engine here, I can go ahead and I know that QH over TH is going to be equal to Q over T. And so I can go ahead and put that in for QH. Right? Now one of the things when I do that now, I've got this temperature T that could be changing with my system. So now let's call just make these all little differential amounts of Q and W's, delta Q, delta W. That way we can go ahead and say a very small amount where T is constant. I'm going to go ahead and do another substitution, and I'm just going to go ahead and make this total work, the reversible work of my system. Of, of the heat engine and the work of the system, we call that WC for the combined system. So if I do that, I now have that delta E is going to be equal to TH. I've got del Q over T, and now I'm going to be go ahead and adding in the combined work. I should have, as well, there should be a, a minus there. So this is a minus here, a minus the combined work. All right. I'm going to go ahead and move the combined work to the left hand side and my energy to the right hand side so I have a total amount of del WC and that's equal to pH del Q over T minus delta E. Well what I'm now going to do is I'm going to go ahead and allow this system to go through an integral number of cycles. So for example it may put a little bit of heat down into my system, my system expands, generates some work. Then I go ahead and push back on the system. It's going to send some heat back up here. And I'll go ahead and go back and forth, back and forth several times. But I'll do this a complete number of cycles so that when I begin and when I end, the state of my system is the exact same. So if I now do that, I've got what the total combined work is. And I'm going to integrate, and this is called a cyclic integral, meaning that I integrate to where my return, my final system is the exact same state as the initial system of TH del Q over T. Now this term right over here is zero because if I come back to the exact same state I was at initially, then there's going to be no net change inside my system. So what I see is here's, here's an, an equation for the um, total work being generated by my system. 
And if I see I've got a system that's interacting with just a simple single temperature reservoir, so that means that this cannot be a positive quantity of work, or that would violate the Carnot principle. So what I know is that Wc has to be less than or equal to zero, which says that the cyclic integral of Th del Q over T has to be less than or equal to zero. It could be equal to zero if my system down here was also reversible. Then sort of like the pendulum problem where it's going back and forth between kinetic energy and potential energy. All right, so let's go ahead and, and take this a little further. And again, I'm going to have my system, QH, I'm going to go ahead and write down the same system or terms that I had before, W reversible, W of my system, this is Q, and it is at a temperature T. But now I'm going to have my, stipulate that my system has to be reversible. And if it's reversible, that means that at any point, all these arrows could just go right back in the opposite direction. Now, if I did that and did the energy balance again, I would end up with the same equation for the combined work, which is going to be the cyclic integral of Th del Q over T. But now what I realize is that here's my combined work. I'm putting work in. I can go ahead and put work in and generate a Q. I just can't do the opposite. Put in a Q and just get a work out. So what that means is that WC has to be greater than or equal to zero. Therefore, that cyclic integral of TH del Q over T has to be greater than or equal to zero. Now, I now have two relations. If it's reversible, it has to be greater than or equal to zero. If it's irreversible, it's going to be less than or equal to zero. Well, a reversible system is also the same as any little general system. So that means that actually the cyclic integral of TH del Q over T has to be equal to zero. It's got to split the difference between those two. And I can go ahead and divide through by this and just have the cyclic integral of del Q over T equal to zero. Now, well, what does that get us? Well, it turns out if you have something where the cyclic integral is zero, it is a property. And the reason for that, it means, is that if you go ahead and have a particular value, so here I have a particular value of this, and I go ahead and move around, but I come back to where all the other properties are the same, pressures, temperatures, internal energies, and my value hasn't changed, I can also be used in the state postulate to define the state of the system. And so that's the definition of entropy. Entropy is this quantity. It's a little weird, but what it is is a change in entropy, and we're going to use the symbol S, the capital S, is going to be the integral of del Q over T of a reversible system. So if I want to know what the change in entropy is, I want to know how much heat I put in, but I'm normalizing it by the temperature each time. All right, I want to talk to you a little bit more about reversible processes. We did a little bit of this in, in the previous chapter. So let's go ahead and consider a, a, a state diagram. And I'm going to use two properties now. I'm going to use T and S, temperature and entropy, because we just saw entropy as a property. So all states are defined on this two-dimensional plot. And maybe here's my initial state. We call it state one. And up here is my final state. I'll go ahead and call that state two. Now, if I wanted to know how I get from one to two, and I wanted to know what delta S was in between that. Well, what I could do is I could just go ahead and integrate del Q over T as long as I added that reversibly. And I would go ahead and track this line right here. And so each time the temperature might change a little bit, it goes up and I have a little bit more delta S delta S. Okay. Now that's a reversible path, right? And so here, let's imagine how I could do that. I have a piston cylinder and I put in a little bit of Q, measure the temperature, put in a little bit of Q, measure the temperature, and those are the points along that line. But there's another way I could get to this higher temperature. Instead of adding heat, maybe I put a, a paddle wheel in here and just whirl it around for a really long time, and if this was otherwise insulated, I might end up at that final temperature. But I might actually follow a path that looks like this, and actually getting to point two would be a little different than point one. Now here, I am just putting work in. It's going into an increase in internal energy. And that's not a reversible. I can't go ahead and just have this cool off and generate work. So this path up here is an irreversible path, whereas this one down here was a reversible path. So if you ever want to determine what the quantity of delta S is, you can follow the reversible path and you can get there. But if you just start at one and you end up at point two, you could get there either from a reversible or an irreversible path. 
All right. Um, I want to look a little bit deeper at this uh, delta S inequality. So we're going to kind of do a, a thought problem here. And so what I have is a frictionless piston cylinder device. And I'm going to keep it at a constant temperature, T0. And so what I've got is a mixture of, of liquid and gas inside this piston cylinder device. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add an amount of heat, Q. And that amount of heat, Q, is going to go ahead and, and cause some of this to vaporize. And so um, I'm going to end up with a few more gas molecules, a little bit less liquid molecules, and I'll be at this new state. And it has actually lifted this piston up. So uh, there's been a, you know, some energy stored and potential energy relishing that piston head up. Now I'm going to go ahead and pull the amount of Q back out, the exact amount of heat that I just put in. And so if this is a frictionless system, I'm going to return back to my exact same system. This whole time it has been at a constant temperature, T0. And if I wanted to go ahead and, and add up what the change in entropy was, well remember, I'm going to integrate del Q over T. And so initially, I'm going to do it for my two steps here. I put in an amount Q over T0. And then I subtracted amount Q over T0. And so then that was equal to zero. Okay? This was a reversible process. I went ahead and moved my piston head up, stored some energy and potential energy with it, and then got it back out. All right. Well, now let's look at an irreversible process. So now I've got a similar piston cylinder device, but maybe it's really rusted. And so there's a lot of friction that's going to occur if I try to move this piston head up on it. Now, again, I'm going to go ahead and put an amount of heat Q into my system. But what's going to happen now is due to that friction, there's going to be a lot of grinding, and the piston head isn't going to go up as far. There's going to be some potential energy, but less than I had before, and that grinding and friction is going to go ahead and put a little bit of extra heat inside there. And now what I want to do is I want to get back to my initial state, because I want to, want to get back here. So in order to get back to that state, I've got to pull out Q, but I also have to pull out this Q from friction, we call that Q out, in order to get back to where I was initially. So now if I want to go ahead and add up my, my total change in entropy here, I've got, I put Q over T0 in, but then I went ahead and subtracted Q over T0 and subtracted QF over T0. And I realize that that right there, that number right there, is going to be less than or equal to zero. So here you realize that the integral of the heat transfer is going to be less than or equal to zero. It's zero for reversible processes and frictionless processes. And it's going to be less than zero. You can say less than or equal. In this case, it's definitely less than zero for an irreversible process. For example, one that has friction. All right. So... Let's look at a special case, which would be isothermal entropy change, similar to what we just looked at before. And so we know that ds, differential change in entropy, which is a capital S here, is going to be equal to del Q over T. And so if I integrate that, I'm going to get my change in entropy. And if I'm going to need to integrate this. Now, if T is a constant, T0, like I had in the, sim in the previous example, this becomes 1 over T0 the integral of del Q, which is equal to just simply the total amount of heat transfer Q. So delta S is equal to Q over T0. So for an isothermal system, it's fairly straightforward to go ahead and find out what the change in entropy is. So let's go ahead and, and do an example here. I've got a frictionless piston cylinder device. It has two kilograms of saturated liquid water. So this is all liquid and now it's going to go ahead and be heated until it's a saturated vapor. And you go ahead and put a bunch of heat in, and it's going to become a saturated vapor. And I want to know what's the change in entropy of this system. So we're going to start off with the first law. Change in energy is energy in minus energy out. And so the change in energy in my system here is going to be M U2 minus U1. The heat that's going in is Q minus some boundary work because my piston cylinder is going to go ahead and expand. Um, if it's a constant pressure, I can move my boundary work to the other side, and I have M H2 minus H1 is equal to Q. And so if I'm going from a saturated liquid to a saturated vapor, this is going to end up being M H F G. So that's going to be the amount of heat that I put in. Let's go ahead and calculate what that is. I have two kilograms. And my HFG value is 2201 
kilojoules per kilogram. That's going to be, and now if I go ahead and do that arithmetic, that's 4403 kilojoules. Oops, sorry, not per kilogram, it's 443 kilojoules. And so if this occurred at a constant temperature, I can now go ahead and find out what my change in entropy is. Delta S, which is going to be Q over T naught, which is going to be Q over the saturation. And so T sat at this condition, which, um, oh, it wasn't written on here. I'm sorry. This is at 200 kPa. That should have been written in the problem. This is at 200 kilopascal, so you know what this value of T naught is. You also needed that to find out what HFG is. Sorry about that. Um, this will now be 4403 over T sat is 123.2. And this value, this T has to be an absolute. So we need to make this into 273. Because recall, when we did those ratios and we defined entropy, those were an absolute temperature. So this ends up telling me what my change in entropy is, which is 11.11, and that's going to be kilojoules per Kelvin. All right. Let's just talk a little bit more again about, about entropy generation. So let's go back to this process where I had a point 0.1 here and point 0.2 here. And here was my reversible path, which would have been, we can get them just summing up del Q over T. right? And then there was some irreversible path this way. And what we saw is that there's going to be a, a larger change in entropy going from the left hand on this irreversible path because you've got a delta S here and then there's going to be an entropy generation due to the irreversibility. So what you realize, if I was to go in this direction, I would increase an amount delta S. And then if I wanted to go back down this way, right, I would be subtracting a delta S2 that would be larger than delta S1. That would be less than zero. Well, that you cannot do because this is, by definition, irreversible. You can't go in the reverse direction. Now, I could reverse the reversible path. So I could go in this direction and then in that direction, or then I would go ahead and have delta S2 minus delta S1, and that's going to be greater than zero. And that's fine. Reversible, by definition, or something I can go ahead and go in the reverse direction. So what I see is that I'm always going to be generating entropy anytime I have some type of irreversible step in my process. All right, um, let's look a little bit about entropy transfer. All right? And I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, take this kind of simple system where I've got some temperature reservoirs. So I have a high temperature reservoir up here at 800 Kelvin, and I have two low temperature reservoirs. I have one at 500 Kelvin and another one at 750 Kelvin. And I'm going to go ahead and move 2,000 kilojoules between both of them. Remember, these are temperature reservoirs, so their temperatures don't change. Okay. Let's go ahead and calculate the change in entropy on the left-hand side here. So delta S is equal to, and recall, I'm going to add up Q over T, which are uh, constant temperature reservoirs. So I've got minus 2,000 kilojoules coming out of 800 Kelvin. And that 2,000 kilojoules, so this is going to be positive, is going into the 500 Kelvin sink. And so that right there is equal to 1.5 kilojoules per Kelvin which just means moving the heat 2,000 kilojoules from there generated 1.5 kilojoules per Kelvin of entropy. Now, if I go ahead and look at the, the second system, where I have a higher temperature sink down here, minus 2,000 over 800, same 2,000 kilojoules coming out, but now I'm going to go ahead and add 2,000 over 750, and this number right over here is only 0.2 kilojoules per Kelvin. So you realize it's getting smaller and generating less entropy, and that's because these temperatures are getting closer and closer to each other. The further there is a temperature difference, the more entropy I generate. Yeah. But there's something kind of interesting that I can actually do right in here, which is if instead of just dumping the heat, if I went ahead and put in a reversible heat engine in here so that I could go ahead and generate a little bit of work and then dump the rest down here. So this will be my QH. Here's QL and generate some work. And if this is a reversible heat engine, I can find out what its efficiency is. The efficiency of the heat engine is 1 minus TL over TH. So let's go ahead and look on, on the left hand side here. This would be 1 minus 500 over 800. And so the efficiency of an engine operating between those two right there is 0 0.375. 
So that means that 37.5% of the heat I put in, I can generate from work. Let's calculate that. Work is 0 0.375 times 2,000 kilojoules. And that right there is equal to 750 kilojoules. So there's the amount of work, which means that QL is going to be 2,000 minus 750 or 1250. All right. So now let's look at the entropy being generated now. So delta S of this system is still taking 2,000 out of the high temperature reservoir at 800, but now I'm only dumping 1,250 into the low temperature reservoir. So that's 1,250 over 500 there. And if I go ahead and do this arithmetic, I find out that that's equal to a flat bust. Yeah. And in fact, that's actually always going to happen. It's not a coincidence. Because I've got a reversible heat engine here, I'm generating no entropy. Therefore, I see that when I calculated explicitly.